Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the channel, everybody. Um, already the summer solstice is here, and we are continuing these streams on a weekly basis. We're on a pretty decent streak. Um, often, usually with this streaming series, we can go for like two, three episodes in, and then something big happens that we have to handle as a team, or we got an event somewhere, and oh, we can't do a stream. Tune in next week, guys. Um, but uh, I got to say, I am really, really, really proud of the operations team, of the comms team over at AFL for putting my feet to the fire, but also making sure that we come out with content on a weekly basis for all of you. The videos that we have coming out, clipping out bits of these episodes into short form content, the view count there is only growing. And we really do like to listen to all of your ideas. We have an ideas channel, for instance, in our Atheist for Liberty members Discord server. We read over that every day. Uh, we listen to all of you in the YouTube comments. We're trying to get more engaged with all of you and to get you guys in the fold, but we also want to show you all that we're listening to you and that we really do appreciate everything that you guys are saying. And I'm really thrilled to bring on uh, our, our upcoming guest here for the next minute or so. Um, we want to diversify the content uh, on this channel. That's why I have a special announcement to make. We're going to be bringing forth 10 LGBTQIA Black Lives Matter activists onto our board of directors. Uh, we really care about diversity so much that, um, you know what, mission aside, uh, we're going to care about how you look and uh, how you feel more than what you think. Just kidding. Uh, but uh, we really do care about diversity of thought and value that we have on this channel. <laughs> and so we want to talk about a variety of different topics. We get into politics a lot. We get into culture war topics a lot in relation to atheism. But I feel like we could really dabble more into philosophy. And so I'm really happy uh, to uh, to see the conversations that we're going to have here tonight, because not only do we uh, fight for enlightenment values here at Atheists for Liberty, but we seek to learn from the greatest minds of the 21st century. That list of great minds is only increasing, and it's thanks to all of you and all of your recommendations that that's going to be continuing far into the future. But I want to state our monthly uh, our member of the week, uh, that is going to be Graham King. So guys, be like Graham and become a member today at atheistsforliberty.org. All donations are tax deductible. We're a 501c3 educational nonprofit. We have awesome events in our Discord server. We're promoting more of our content online. We fight for church-state separation. We're having more events throughout the United States and online events for people around the world to tune into. It's thanks to all of you really donating to a growing nonprofit that's making more and more of this amazing content possible. So be like Graham guys and sign up today. There's awesome benefits listed on the website. It really, really means a lot. So without any further delay, I will introduce our guest. So Jeff Lauder is based in Seattle, Washington and is best known for co-founding the Internet Infidels, the group that runs infidels.org, one of the first atheist websites on the internet and a major site for atheistic philosophy of religion. He was the editor of a retired blog called The Secular Outpost and has debated various theists on God's existence, including Phil Fernandez, Kevin Vandergriff, and Frank Turek. I remember seeing Frank Turek debates. Any atheist that can that can handle Frank Turek is a friend of mine. So <laughs> Jeffrey Lauder, welcome to the channel. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here. So we got a lot to talk about. I really I, I was telling you this backstage, you know, we, we talk a lot of politics on this channel. We talk a lot of culture war issues. And I bet we're going to even dabble into some of that, especially when the Q&A comes. But um, we're an atheist organization. We are atheists for liberty. So not only do we have to talk about liberty related issues and how atheism and enlightenment flourish, uh, enlightenment values can flourish um, in today's society with the whole culture war stuff going on. But we're an atheist organization. We got to talk about atheism. We got to talk about the things behind atheism. What makes atheists different from theists? What makes our arguments different and better than religious ones? So I'm very glad to have you on. I really want to say I appreciate you. I appreciate you for your service, sir. But I appreciate you for being one of the first atheists on the internet um, to be combative against dogmatic religious claims. Um, it's people like you that kind of paved the way for us, paved the way for this channel, paved the way for our opinion piece, our newsletter. And we're one of many different atheist groups out there. So um, my hats are off to, to people like you always for, for making things like this show possible. Because, you know, if you didn't do it 20 years ago, blogging and, and debunking Turek, nobody at that time would have. Well, thanks. It's great to be here. So we'll get into a few different questions. I want to thank uh, Justin Vakula, uh, too, for, for helping to uh, formulate some of them. Justin's suggestions are always uh, always great when it comes to getting 
amazing good quality guests on the program um, and he wrote a bunch of really good ones and we took a few from them i know you were taking a look at some of them too and um we, we formulate them into some good uh some good topics here so you're known for promoting naturalism that's one of the big things that you've done with one of your old retired blogs and it's a big non-religious identity uh, there are a lot of atheists who I've talked to at atheist conferences and events that say, okay, do you believe in God? What do you call yourself? I'm a naturalist. And compared to a lot of other identities, atheist, agnostic, skeptic, humanist, what makes that naturalist label so important? What is naturalism? And can you define it and explain why it's more likely to be the case instead of theism or, or supernaturalism of any kind? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, the idea is that reality seems to have two parts to it, um, the mental and the physical, at least what we would call concrete reality. And um, a naturalist says that the physical gets priority. We know that the physical exists. And if there is anything mental, the physical caused the mental to come into existence. So what would that mean? To put it very crudely, it would mean that until central nervous systems and brains or things like central nervous systems and brains evolved, there wasn't anything mental happening anywhere. Um, the opposite point of view is um, supernaturalism. And it says, it gives the mental the priority. It says that the mental exists. And if there is anything physical, the mental caused the physical to exist. So it could be that, you know, there was just a, a, a ghost or a spirit or God, um, uh, or it could be that something, uh, you know, supernatural decided to create physical reality. And so then you get into things like theism, which say that the underlying mental reality is a, sin a single person a perfect supernatural person that somehow caused the physical universe to come into existence. So naturalism and supernaturalism are perfect mirrors of each other or counterparts to each other. Theism is a very specific uh, version of supernaturalism. Uh, so when you say you're an atheist, all, all that tells us is, uh, depending on how you define the word atheist, it either tells us you don't believe in God, or maybe you go further and define atheist as uh, someone who believes God does not exist. But regardless of how you define it, that doesn't really lay out a worldview. Naturalism is a worldview, because, uh, or it's most of a worldview, because it gives you a much more comprehensive view of, of what concrete reality looks like. Um, and I, I'm using the word concrete because there may be a third, what some people call a third realm of abstract reality. Um, uh, and if that exists, there would be abstract objects like numbers, propositions, sets, possible worlds, states of affairs, whatever. But we can sort of leave that over to the side because if they exist, they don't cause anything and they're not the effect of anything. They're just sort of there. Um, in terms of what can be a cause or an effect, um, uh, what we think we know is that there are mental things and physical things and people, uh, most people would agree that both exist. There are eliminative, eliminative materialists who would deny, uh, that there's anything mental and there are eliminative idealists who would deny that there's anything physical, but most people would say that we have both physical and mental stuff. And the question is, how do they fit together? Um, you know, uh, you, I guess you could you could be an atheist and be a supernaturalist, but that would be uncommon. Most yeah. atheists are naturalists because they say not only do they not believe in gods, they don't believe in demons or angels or spirits. Um, uh, they don't believe in any of that stuff. Um, and the reason they don't believe that is because they believe that nothing mental happens without something physical happening. Mm -hmm. uh, so if there's no brain, no central nervous system, no neurons, there is no mind and therefore there's nothing mental. I remember um, during my high school years and, and, and college years, uh, I would always interact with some interesting spiritual types on campus uh, whenever I was trying to promote atheism or, or engage in any kind of student activism. Uh, I'd always meet every now and then, you know, a kind of um, blue haired so-called atheist. 
uh, who says, I'm an atheist, but I believe in ghosts. I'm an atheist, but I believe in spirits, Thomas. And it's very insensitive. It's very uh, uh, insensitive of you to uh, uh, to go after the supernatural. So uh, I'm, I'm assuming they would they would be within that kind of uh, atheist, but supernatural kind of camp. The uh, the grifter, the grifters of, of the uh, religious culture wars, I, I would argue that they are. Yeah, you could divide supernaturalism up into two branches. One branch is personal supernaturalism, which says that the underlying, uh, uh, you know, mental uh, uh, entity or entities that explain the physical universe is a person or like a person. And, you know, it could be limited to a single person, which would be monotheism, or it could be multiple persons, which is what people usually think of when they say polytheism. But the other branch would be impersonal supernaturalism. Um, and that doesn't really get talked about uh, as much uh, among uh, atheist groups, I think. But um, the kind of person you're describing, yeah, they're an atheist, but they're also an, uh, an impersonal supernaturalist because they they believe in uh, ghosts or, or spirits or whatever. So um, I like the word naturalist because it, um, it, uh, it's more descriptive. Uh, you're, you're not only saying, you know, what you don't believe, which is, you know, I don't believe in God, but you're saying what you do believe, which is that you think the physical uh, ultimately caused the, the mental to exist. Yeah. Um, and, and you don't get that kind of description if all you say is you're an atheist. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 I rightfully tell people that, that atheism is not a belief system of any kind. It doesn't really solve, um, a lot of philosophical problems that we have as a society. Um, I think it's very important for you to call yourself one in order to, uh, politically and culturally, um, uh, remove stigmas that are in society against non-religious people. Uh, but, but. In order to live a more fulfilling life, you have to have a you know a bigger framework when it comes to this stuff. I uh, I recently got back from Phoenix, Arizona. I was at the Objective Standard Institute's nat, uh, national convention, uh, their their Level Up conference, and I was talking to a lot of people who were proud atheists who were in the room around ninety five to ninety nine percent atheistic attendance, you know, mainly young people from around the world, Latin America even, not even mm -hmm. like a western country you know filled with a lot of secularism but even amongst like a lot of latin americans and brazilians that were there these are all people that were atheists but who proudly exp expressed their um their interest in objectivism because they made the claim that atheism only solves one question and one question only and i think we have to have more of those conversations we have to incorporate people um who are atheists but who have explanations for deeper meanings in society and for how they go about their lives that's why i'm very excited to be bringing up the naturalist topic because we we got into that with existentialism with william Irwin. uh we got objective uh, objectivism kind of covered although we want to talk about that more on the channel but naturalism is another huge big identity and people don't know too much about it so yeah. i gotta say i think i think you will be our our signature kind of uh naturalist um uh, uh advocate uh, within the organization, which always uh, which always means a lot. Um, but so so with a lot of these people who uh, they, they call themselves atheists, but they don't really have a naturalistic framework uh, for the rest of society. You know, th those type of people that I interacted with, you know, they're not really convincing. They're not really convincing most of the time. I was able to brush past their stuff a lot. And you've uh, had a lot of experience with brushing past a lot of ridiculous arguments, including from a plenty of our favorite Christian apologists throughout the years. So you haven't been really persuaded by these apologists like, you know, the William Lane Craig's of the world. Um, you know, he provides a lot of these kind of moral arguments and evidence for theism from this kind of intellectual perspectives. And unfortunately, uh, I think too many, uh, too many people from these kind of intellectual high backgrounds on Twitter are starting to buy into. If you could just spend a few minutes, can you explain why the William Lane Craig's of the world and his moral arguments are, are kind of bogus. Um, his, his, his arguments still don't hold weight in 2023. Yeah, uh, I'll begin by saying that although uh, I think we have to, you know, uh, there's there's a bell curve of, of arguments uh, for God's existence, and there's a bell curve of thinkers um, who've argued for God's existence. Um, you know, what I think we're going to be getting into today is probably, you know, uh, over on the right-hand side of the bell curve, I, I fully get the fact that what we're going to talk about is going to be 
more intellectual than I think what the average person on the street runs into. So, um, you know, I'm personally interested in reading academic philosophy, but I totally get the fact that that's not everybody's cup of tea. And that, you know, if you're just someone listening to this interview and, uh, you know, you're, you're talking to someone at, uh, on the street or in a, uh, in a, in a restaurant or whatever, um, they're probably going to use arguments that aren't as sophisticated as this. So I just want right. to sort of say that, you know, from the get go, but, um, I, you know, William Lane Craig is brilliant. Um, he's, he's a very smart man. He has two earned doctorates and really he should have three because I happen to know that he just wrapped up a 13 year study of metaphysics on abstract objects, that third realm that I was mentioning a few minutes ago. Um, uh, he's done a tremendous amount of research. So he's, I mean, he's clearly, uh, very, very smart. Um, the thing about his moral argument is interesting because, um, I almost uh, was convinced that God exists because of his moral argument. Um, I did not like the responses that I was seeing from fellow atheists and agnostics back in the early 90s um, when I was um, you know, first encountering his materials. And the way his argument goes, well, the way it went back then, he's made a, a minor change that isn't really matter for this discussion. But the way it went back then was, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist, but objective moral values do exist, therefore God exists. And the go-to responses of atheists and agnostics has always been a combination of attacking the existence of objective moral values and appealing to something from Plato called the Euthyphro Dilemma. And um, I, um, I I don't like the the denying of objective moral values uh, as a response for a bunch of reasons. Um, even if I, so I think that objective moral values do exist, but whether I think they exist or not, I actually think it's kind of a red herring, because I think the the the, the fatal flaw in the argument is the first premise. Um, where it says, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. I think that's a complete, uh, I, I think that's false. Um, and so I think that that's what we should focus on. A lot of people think, and I'm saying this as someone who thinks objective moral values exist, a lot of people think that if you deny objective moral values, therefore you're denying any sense of morality of, uh, at all. And, uh, and in fact, when an atheist does it, I think it's actually kind of a PR mistake because it feeds the narrative that there's a conflict between atheists and morality, not an abstract philosophical right. disagreement, but like um, uh, a conflict with real societal implications because atheists are going to go eat babies or, you know, yeah. whatever absurd, you know, thing someone is going to think of. So I, I think it it feeds into the hands of um, uh, religious, uh, uh, re uh, certain members of the religious community because it, it helps to perpetuate a stereotype against atheists. Um, uh, I'm so with you on that. Uh, I'll just yeah. quickly bump in here. You know, as, a, as the president of an atheist organization, right, we every single day get contacted or get YouTube comments or emails from theists that are looking to debunk us or state how wrong we are. We are an atheist advocacy organization trying to show that you can be an ethical minded human being while not believing in God. And 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 not only that, we're trying to not not to you know state this herring a million times, we're different than the other atheist groups in that we're not going to be making the same PR nightmare mistakes that other orgs have done. You know, splitting uh, the the objectivist minded atheists from from atheists who who care about enlightenment values but might be more subjective in their thinking, having those discussions in in appropriate environments instead of promoting this idea that everything is subjective as atheists is a way better way to go about that discussion. Um, and it's it's been a PR nightmare for the atheist community for such a long time because of those very mistakes. Take the philosophy out of it. Just from the business perspective, we have had to tackle and are still tackling in 2023 that same problem. And that problem needs to end, especially yeah. if we're going to try to succeed on a national scale. Yeah. I mean, there, I mean, there, uh, I, so I think that you can be an intelligent person and a good person and not believe in objective moral values. So I'm sure there are people in the audience who, you know, want to debate, do objective moral values exist? All I would say is, yeah, I, I know you're out there. I know you're smart. 
I know you're a good person. And that's, um, that's a, a, a tactical mistake in terms of responding to this kind of apologetic argument for God's existence. Um, the reason that this argument, I think, is so persuasive in, in the minds of so many people, I think there's a few reasons. One reason is a lot of people think of morality as a, a set of rules or a set of laws and, and what's the other context where we think of rules or laws uh, outside of morality? Well, rules, we can think of rules for games. And then laws we think of as things passed by legislatures. What do all of those things have in common? Well, they have rule makers or lawmakers. So they say if, if morality is a system of laws, well, then morality must have a lawmaker or a lawgiver. And who, who else could be qualified to do that uh, other than God? Um, that's, that's a terrible argument. Um, we don't, uh, just as the laws of, we can make an analogy. The laws of morality don't need a lawmaker, just like the laws of logic don't need a lawmaker. Um, something is either true or false, period, full stop. Yep. And there's no, there's no entity. There's no abstract object. There's no mental being. There's no physical object that makes it that way. It's, it's a necessary truth about reality, and um, uh, it, it does not depend upon anything uh, uh, for that to be, to be true or, or to exist. Um, uh, one plus one equals two is mathematically necessary. There's, there's nothing that makes it the case that one plus, I shouldn't say there's nothing. There, it doesn't depend upon the will or nature of an immaterial being. It doesn't depend upon human opinions. Those things are uh, as objective as anything could be. They're things that, uh, that I think we discover about reality rather than invent. Um, the point being that if the laws of logic and the laws of, uh, you know, we call them laws of mathematics, if those don't require a lawgiver, then why would the laws of morality require a lawgiver? So the lawgiver analogy is, is terrible. Um, a, another reason that I think this argument works is that there's this strange dichotomy between the way that the, the way William Lane Craig and Frank Turek and Christian philosophers and apologists think and talk and the way the average person thinks and talks. So to their credit, Dr. Craig and uh, Turek uh, make it very clear that they are not claiming that atheists cannot be moral people. They've, they've gone out of their way to say that over and over and over again. They could say it for the next hundred years and it'll go in one ear and out the other. Because yeah. while they're saying that, what the average person hears is if you don't believe in God, you can't be a good person. So Craig's trying to give this dressed up, academic argument about meta-ethics um, uh, and the average person uh, is just, it, it, I, I don't know what's going on, but they're, they're not hearing it. The average person is hearing atheists can't, good be, can't be good people. And so when atheists, an average atheist hears that, they get defensive. And when an average theist hears that, they uh, uh, what I think is going on is they say, well, here's a really smart philosopher um, backing up my bias against atheists because I already have a stereotype that they're not to be trusted. They're immoral people. Yeah. And therefore, um, I'm right and atheists are wrong. It, right. And so even though Craig, to his, again, I want to make this very clear, William Lane Craig is not spreading the, the belief that atheists are bad people. He goes out of his way to say that, you know, there are atheists who are far better people than theists. Even though he does that, his audience, I don't think for the most part, listens and gets the message. Right. So, and then you've got the atheists who uh, either in the audience or on the debate stage who are responding. And it's very easily to get, very easy to get triggered by that and get defensive from an emotional point of view. And then from a logical point of view, um, a lot of the atheists who do debates, this is starting to change, but for most of the time that I've been involved, have been uh, anti-realists. They've been moral relativists or moral subjectivists. So they take the bait and they they want to argue that objective moral values do not exist. If I were a moral relativist, 
I wouldn't talk about that at all in my debates. I would focus, I wouldn't hide the fact that I was a relativist, but I would say, look, this really has nothing to do with it because atheism isn't about morality. This is an example of why atheism isn't a worldview. There is no the atheist worldview. There are many atheist worldviews. Objectivism with a capital O arguably is an atheist worldview. Secular humanism, arguably, is an atheist worldview. Communism, arguably, I mean, there are lots of atheist worldviews that have totally different ideas about morality. Why is that possible? Because atheism isn't about morality, just like atheism isn't about the temperature of the sun. You could believe that the temperature of the sun is 10 million degrees or 100 trillion degrees and be a consistent, that's just not what it's about. So when someone says, if you know God does not exist, objective moral values exist, I think if God does not exist, then the temperature of the sun is not 6 million degrees. That I mean, that's just, it has nothing to do with that. The reason this resonates with theists, the other reason, if they can get past their, their stereotypes and biases against atheists, is that they have, they, uh, I'm going to pull on a word from, uh, social justice issues. So you'll hear social justice uh, people talk about privilege, like white privilege, male privilege. Well, I think there's theistic privilege. And so an example of theistic privilege is centering theism in conversations about morality. If you're a theist, you don't have to believe this, but it's very likely that you believe that morality is somehow linked to what God commands. And so if that's your if that's your normal, if that's how you start thinking about these topics, then it would be very natural for you to say, well, if atheism is true, there are no commands. There's no commander. So how could there be commands? And so that resonates with them. But that that should not be the default. And so when I talk about a theistic privilege or a Christian privilege, that's one of the things I mean. They're, they're making this idea of a command-centered or you know, some sort of divine being-centered uh, view of morality as the default. And that, that should not be the de default. It may be the default in a historical perspective, because for so long, so many people have thought that. But from a, a philosophical perspective, that, that shouldn't be the default at all. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I'll pause there well, so you can, you know. Conversation. All's fair yeah. in, the love, in the love and war of the battle of ideas. Um, every idea should be subject to scrutiny. And I, I um, when you said Christian privilege or theist privilege, it, it really did remind me of of my childhood, growing up and hearing th those words. I uh, I haven't heard them for a long time, so I think it's a very valid point to make. And and going then into our next our next conversation uh, relating to the arguments of some of these prominent Christians, um, prominent thinkers on the other side. Kind of what would in your mind, what do you think is the strongest argument that these apologists have to offer, um, just just from the top of your head? Uh, the argument from consciousness. So if you go back to you know the idea that reality seems to have two parts, the mental and the physical, um, naturalism, the way I define it, you know, um, which again uh, simply talks about the relationship between the mental and the physical. Naturalism is not the view that nature is all there is because naturalism doesn't say if there is a third realm of abstract objects. Um, so if you're trying to explain the relationship between the mental and the physical, um, it, it, it didn't turn out this way, but if, you know, if you assume that naturalism is true, there could have been a sterile universe with rocky planets and no biological life of any kind. And from a naturalist perspective, it, not only is that a sterile universe, that's a, uh, a, a non-mental universe. There are no mental beings anywhere in the universe. So if naturalism is true, it's not a sure bet that minds are going to evolve uh, in you know, complex life forms. Whereas if supernaturalism is true, you already know that there's at least one mind because that's built into the definition of supernaturalism. Um, and theism, out of all the different versions of supernaturalism, I personally think that there, there are good arguments to show that monotheism is the most likely to be true out of all the different theistic yeah. views. Like, like so, if theism was to be correct. 
Right. So, so we know that minds exist because, you know, you could be wrong about everything else, but you still have to exist in order to be wrong. Sort of the, I think I, there, you know, therefore I am our argument. Um, so the fact that, um, uh, that something mental exists by itself is uh, better predicted by theism than by naturalism. That's not a God of the gaps argument. This has nothing to do with science, right? Tomorrow there could be an announcement out of Oxford University that they've come up with a complete theory of consciousness that totally solves that. That would not change this argument at all because naturalism doesn't predict that the universe um, is going to have conscious life. Um, uh, theism doesn't predict it either, but uh, theism at least already has one mental entity. And, and so in that sense, you know, that's, uh, I think, the best argument that they have. Um, of course, the fact that conscious life exists isn't the only thing we know about the relationship between the mental and the physical. So given that conscious life exists, the fact that all non-question-begging examples of consciousness that we know of depend upon a physical brain is much more likely on the assumption that naturalism is true than on the assumption that supernaturalism is true. So uh, if a theist uses the argument from consciousness, depending upon how they, how they do it, they might commit a fallacy of reasoning called the, uh, the fallacy of understated evidence. Um, uh, so if they say, you know, consciousness is evidence for God's existence, and that's everything we know about consciousness and, uh, you know, mental phenomenon, they're understating the evidence mm -hmm. because, um, you know, uh, if, if you believe that we are, uh, there's a thing called substance dualism. So if you think that we're somehow a composite of a physical body and an immaterial spirit, mind or soul, it's, it's pretty surprising that people who get Alzheimer's uh, undergo radical changes to their personality. It's, it's pretty surprising that um, before I get my caffeine in the morning, I'm a different person than after I get my caffeine. It's pretty surprising that the bigger the size of a brain, um, uh, that is correlated with greater mental abilities. Um, it's pretty surprising that there was a guy in the 1800s who suffered a catastrophic skull injury. I think there was like a spike that went into his brain or something, but like the whole front chunk of both hemispheres was destroyed. Um, well, that's where your prefrontal cortex is. Uh, that affects the executive functioning. He went from being a very nice person to, I want to say like a sociopath or something. All of this makes perfect sense on the assumption that the mind just is the brain. Um, but this is really surprising if some sort of dualism is true and, you know, you can have minds without bodies. Um, so that, that would be, I went through that really fast, but that would be an example of how, yeah, there is some evidence for God's existence. Consciousness is more likely on theism than on naturalism. But when you look at the full body of the evidence relevant to consciousness, then it's not so clear cut. I think uh, there's some people in the uh, in the chat. I'll showcase this. You got uh, Justin saying, uh, Phineas Gage was the spike guy. Yes, thank uh, you. And uh, yeah, th that Stephen was also mentioning that yep. uh, they, they were they were off by like a second of each other. So I'll give them I'll give them both credit. I'll give them guys, guys. This is the pen, right? Like <laughs> a plus for all of you. Woo! You get your you get your magical AFL points. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, that is crazy. Um, and I think it's I think it's um, very important for us as atheists to come time to sometimes give a bone to those we don't agree with, especially if there is evidence to show that there's a tiny little bit or a tiny little chunk that they're right. I think it shows that we are more mature and more free thinking than others. So that's another atheist for liberty point that we could get. <laughs> so I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, so so going into the last main question then. Uh, because we're talking about morality, we're talking about um, objectivism versus subjectivism, although we're going to have more objectivists on the channel, guys. So just letting you know, we'll do an objectivist-themed episode. I'll bring either Craig Biddle on or my friend Thomas Walker Wirth from the Objective Standard Institute on or, or, or John Hersey or a few other people on. Um, 
I'm a common AFLW. We're going to showcase some Q and A's on in a bit, but we're going to have an objectivist themed episode. But um, uh, but pertaining to this main question, this is this is always one of the big you know questions that atheists get in the most simplistic ways. How do you, Jeffrey? How do you live a moral life without religion? So. Um... I've given this a lot of thought. I actually spend more time thinking about morality than I do atheism. Uh, although atheism uh, and the existence of God is what me, got me thinking about morality and metaethics, and I think um, I think there's a lot of confusion um, in a lot of camps on this because we don't start with a shared def a theoretical definition of what morality is. And so, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. Uh, people will use their own definition of morality, which they may not even have in their, you know, in the forefront of their minds. It may be more of a subconscious idea. But I found something a, a few years ago that, for me, really helped clarify things. And the idea was that you can simplify, maybe oversimplify what philosophers have written about morality and ethics for thousands of years into two camps. There is the, the first camp you can call the social uh, uh, moral system camp that says that morality is a set of rules, which I need to refer to my notes here, which define acceptable or unacceptable behavior towards other people. Um, the alternative approach is called the Socratic moral system, which says that morality is a set of rules which defines acceptable or unacceptable ways for living one's life, including situations which involve other people and including situations which do not. So on a Socratic moral, so if you know, you're know you stranded on the desert island, if there's nobody else there, the social moral system says that there is no morality There's there's uh, because you, there's no one for you to have moral obligations to. The Socratic approach says that even if there's nobody else there, um, you can still be more moral or less moral based on, you know, what you do relative to yourself. And so using either of those definitions, um, I think helps to clarify the question, how do you live a good life? And so um, that leads to the other insight I had uh, a few years ago when I, I ran across uh, a different philosopher. Um, if you, if, People in the audience have taken uh, uh, philosophy courses or courses on ethics, then they're probably familiar with Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative. Um, I, I might be a weird person who believes in objective moral values because I've never been able to make sense of the categorical imperative. I know what it means, but where I'm going with this is the categorical imperative is named that way because it's supposed to be the opposite of a hypothetical imperative. So a hypothetical imperative says, if you want X, do Y. A categorical imperative gets rid of the, if you want X part. It just says you're supposed to do Y, period, full stop. I understand what that means. I've never understood how that would work. Like I can imagine myself being convinced again that God exists. I still wouldn't believe in a categorical imperative. Right. Um, and there are a lot of people, I think, uh, think that you have to assume that there's a categorical imperative. And then the only way to make the categorical imperative work is to add God into the equation. I think that's confused on so many different levels. But one of the levels it's confused on is that they're actually hiding a hypothetical imperative. So the, the theistic hypothetical imperative is if you want a good relationship with God, then obey his commands. If you want to get into heaven, obey his commands. If you want to avoid hell, obey his commands. There's still a hypothetical imperative. No one's ever actually been able to explain the categorical imperative to me in a way that makes sense. So if we're left with hypothetical imperatives, um, wh what are the hypothetical imperatives that translate to a good life? Well, I think part of that is... Um, very objective because it's based on facts about human biology. We know um, that across cultures and across time, there's actually quite a bit of agreement on uh, 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 natural human desires. Um, and there's a guy named Larry Arnhart who wrote a book called Darwinian Natural Right. Um, I don't know if he's an atheist. I don't. He's definitely not a Christian. 
but um i hear the he, word darwinian and i think i automatically attribute like 51 percent chance there. <laughs> yeah yeah um but uh he i i i think he might be agnostic i'm not really sure but um he his book lays out all of this evidence from like anthropology and sociology and it explores all the different desires that are universal across human cultures uh, that are rooted in objective facts about human biology. So connecting what I just said with hypothetical imperatives, I don't know what it means to say something is just good, period. Sometimes I think I do. Sometimes, some days I think I don't know what it means. But I know for sure what it means to say something is good for something else. So I understand what it means to say something is good for human beings. And um, it's very, it's an empirical question, what is good for human beings? You can go investigate that and you can come up with answers, answers that, uh, you know, you can get information that goes back to those two views of morality. Um, what are the set of rules that um, help uh, people to get along in groups. Um, and, you know, there are things that are objectively more conducive to that. And there are things that are objectively less conducive. There are things that contribute to human flourishing and things that don't. Um, uh, so uh, I realize I'm being kind of vague. I'm doing that on purpose because I want to put it into context. Because the, I think if you don't do that and you just dive right into, well, you know, I think morality means this. I think what you wind up is people talking past one another. So it's good to have a theoretical definition of morality before you work your way down into specifics. And instead of them talking past one another, we can just have them talk in the Q&A. That's how we center the discussion. They'll all center like the it. morality arguments there and we'll, we'll showcase them up on the screen. Uh, so, so. Uh, wonderful batch of regular questions. I want to thank uh, I want to thank yourself, uh, Jeffrey, for looking looking over them. But I want to also thank Justin Bakula uh, for for um, for giving them as great suggestions. Hats off to you, Justin, as always, my friend. Um, so we're going to get into Q and A uh, time, everybody. But before then, I just want to make a few little announcements, guys. We're on Instagram. We put on a lot of great graphics and informative content on Instagram alone sometimes. So if you have an Instagram account, go out of your way right now and go to Instagram.com, or if you're on your app go on the Instagram app and type in Atheists for Liberty. We should be the top result. Go ahead and give us a follow. We also happen to be on Twitter. We're on Facebook. We're on a variety of social media platforms. And it really means a lot if all of you can go out of your way and go follow us on these platforms as you're going through your daily lives, questioning your moral framework. Well, instead of just doing that, you can go see what a few of us have to say about that at Atheists for Liberty by liking us and following us on social media. And do you like watching the show so far? You like the content? You like the guests? You like the cute little clips we put up on Mondays and me reviewing woke people or religious people? sometimes in their videos. Well, that always happens here on this YouTube channel. So guys, be sure to like this video for the algorithm and hit the notification bell to see more content. That's one second. That's you liking the video, right? And ooh, ooh, that's that other second. That's you liking uh, the, the more stuff and also hitting the notification bell. Boom. Now, whenever we come out with a video, you're all informed. So let's get into the Q&A. We already have a lot of great ones that are lined up here. I think this is going to be a fantastic second and uh, ch uh, chat here with Jeffrey Lauder himself. So first question, what esoteric knowledge does our guest like the most? Um, I need an example. I could go a couple different directions with that. Can the, uh, can the questioner type in the chat? Uh, an example of what they're thinking of when they say esoteric knowledge. Yeah, we'll see if he does. And if he does, if he had does, I'll scroll all the way down. We'll see if, if that is the case and that I'll. Okay, I'll go we'll, we'll come back to that. But we got, we got a lot. We got a lot of, uh, we got a lot of uh, people in um, already um, putting in their questions. Uh, we got him also asking, uh, I'm going to get microchipped and there's nothing you naturalists can do. <laughs> well, there's nothing that we can do because we live in a free society. So go ahead and get microchipped. Uh, AFL approved. Uh, I know a lot of people who don't have anything mental happening anywhere. Uh, well, unfortunately, in today's world, um, I, I definitely, uh, um, I, uh, I definitely um, agree there. 
Um, we got Rowling saying, I want to meet an atheist who doesn't believe in evolution. Just one atheist who goes, Darwin's theory is dumber than the virgin birth. I don't think I've met any any atheists yet who have uh, who have made those claims. Have you? No, I think what it reminds me of is uh, uh, Richard Dawkins, who said that uh, Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're an atheist, uh, certainly if you're a naturalist, uh, biological evolution is pretty much the only game in town. Awesome. Got another question. Uh, what's your opinion on uh, on Neuralink and other robotic body modifications? Um, I think it's interesting. I mean, it's not something I plan on doing to myself, but um, uh, you know, I think you could you could divide that up into two different groups. I think the first would be what I'll call therapeutic or medical interventions. Um, you know, whether it's um, you know a bionic eye. Or, I mean, arguably, a, a cochlear implant is is kind of in this category already, right? Um, but then there are other things which could be done for either cosmetic purposes or enhancement purposes. I, I don't have, I'm not sure I have anything profound to say. I, I don't think there's an ethical problem with it. It's, you know, really up to the person whether or not that's something what they want to do with their body. Mm. Got Stephen asking, what drew Jeffrey to naturalism over other philosophical views? I know we tapped into this a little bit earlier. Um, it was really exposure to um, uh, Paul Draper's uh, argument about mind-brain dependence. Um, before I'd come across that argument, I just, I mean, I, I thought about the relationship between the mind and the brain, but, um, you know, in the in terms of the existence of God, I was really focused on things like design arguments, the problem of evil, um, uh, things like that. And had, I just, I hadn't given it a whole lot of thought. And then once, once I became exposed to that argument, I realized that provided reasons for not only, um, you know, questioning the existence of God, but questioning the existence of anything that involved a mind without a body. And, that that leads you to naturalism. Very good. Uh, are you familiar with the ontological proof of God's existence? Yeah, uh, I'm familiar with it. Um, I, I I think it's fair to say that uh, the majority of philosophers, and I'm not a professional philosopher, but uh, I think the majority of philosophers would say that that they don't find that argument convincing. Um, and uh, I, I certainly don't. I, I, I don't really spend any time at all thinking about it. I just, um, no disrespect to anyone who might see this video who thinks differently, but I, I just don't take it seriously. I think we're just going to literally, it's like, what do you think of this philosophy? What do you think of that yeah. philosophy? I'm already, uh, well, let's go down the list real quick of that. So we, yeah. got, we got Steven saying, what are our guest view of, of anarcho primitivism? I have to confess my ignorance. I'm not exactly sure what that is. Stephen, if you want to enlighten both of us, please, we will we will showcase more of that. Oh, here we go. Here's a big one. <laughs> Here's a big one. We got Rowling saying, what do you think of Ayn Rand's objectivism? So I am my my degree of knowledge of economics and uh, political philosophy is inversely proportional to my knowledge of philosophy of religion. I know who Ayn Rand is. I know of objectivism with capital O, but I'm ignorant. Oh boy. Now, now we're getting real intellectual here. Okay. Yeah. We got Steven saying, what does Jeff think about the rise of iPad kids? I, I, I think what you're saying, Steven is like kids that like get hooked onto iPads when their parents give them to you at like the age of two or three years old and you get hooked so quickly onto devices and social media at a very, very young age addicted to, to. Yeah. I mean, as a, as a parent myself, I've got, I've got two kids, two teenagers. Um, uh, it's easy as a parent to be able to say, here's a device, go entertain yourself. Um, but that's not good for their brains. Right. Uh, as people who care about evidence and reason, there's, uh, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, but I, I've read several articles from, from, you know, uh, psychologists who specialize in child development and 
uh, uh, neurologists and other things, it it's not good for them. Um, so uh, do I think they should be allowed to, to use an iPad? Yes. Should they even be allowed to have one? Yes. Uh, would I use parental controls, especially with young kids? Absolutely. Um, they, they need time limits. I used to be opposed to parental controls, and in a way, I still kind of am. But now, here's where the wokeism part comes in, guys. Uh, now, with our entire apparatus of social media and even kids' content being filled with different kinds of dogma, not, not just religious dogma, but new forms of political or new kinds of religious dogma, um, I'm starting to question that myself. Uh, more, more evolution on Thomas's views on that to come in the future. Um, we got rolling saying that the YouTuber Alex O'Connor has made some videos explaining why morality cannot be objective. Do you have an opinion on them, and would you be willing to debate him? Hmm. Uh, I I might be willing to debate him. Uh, I haven't. I know who Alex is. I I follow him on Twitter. I, I actually have very watched very few of his videos. Um, I, I tend to spend most of my free time reading. And then when I, when I do stuff, whether it's, you know, an interview like this or write tweets or write essays or whatever, I'm mostly coming up with original content. Um, I need to take a look at what his arguments are uh, before, uh, before I mean, because he might he might change my mind. But you know, I've uh, I've read people like J. L. Mackey, um, uh, who wrote a book called Ethics: Inventing Right and Wrong. Uh, there's a, a a philosopher, a woman named Sharon Street, who wrote a really um, really important article that's probably been cited. I'm not exaggerating a thousand times in the 20 years since it's been written. Called um, what is it called? Uh, Darwinian. Uh, I can't remember the name. It's uh, something like a Darwinian dilemma or something like that. And um, these are the places that uh, informed uh, opponents of uh, objective morality would go to get arguments. Um, I don't find J.L. Mackey's arguments convincing whatsoever. Uh, Sharon Street, however, I think has a uh, a pretty interesting argument that's a lot harder for someone who believes in objective moral values to to deal with. But I, 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 you've actually got me curious now. I need to go find his video or videos on why objective morality is impossible and see what he has to say. Um, so I'll just leave it there. Rowling is great at like digging up things from the atheist world and, and, and from intellectual spheres of thought. So good on you, Rowling. Uh, and definitely, if there is any kind of debate or if he responds to you or anything, you know of a place where maybe that debate could be hosted. So uh, we're yeah. going to be we're going to be having more debates on this channel too, not just the traditional streaming series that we've been having. So maybe you could be one of the first ones. We'll have cool. to see. We got Matthew Hab. Hey, Matthew, asking, do you think the idea of a uniformed default that atheists can't be moral people, despite saying it's not the cause? Um, is apologism affecting culture and politics more as time goes on? No, I don't. Um, I don't. I don't think that at all. It would. It, it would be. I have a motive to say yes to your question, but I just don't. Uh, it would be kind of self-serving for me to to badmouth Christian apologists. But I actually don't think that's the case at all. I think it runs deeper. Um, and I'm I'm out of my depth here, so take what I'm about to say with a grain of salt. But based on the tiny bit that I know about the cognitive science of religion and the psychology of religion, I think there's something deeper going on. Um, I think that humans are hardwired to believe in invisible agents. Um, I subscribe to the hyperactive uh, detection device uh, theory as an explanation for why most people believe in some form of the supernatural, whether it's God or ghosts or demons or whatever. Um, uh, there's a, a very solid evolutionary explanation for why primates or intelligent animals would assume by default that there's an invisible agent. And then, you know, if they find out later that they're wrong, oh, well, it's better to be safe than sorry. You know, if I hear a rustle in the bushes, it's it, there's survival value uh, for me in assuming that there's a, a tiger that's going to eat me, uh, then there is, you know, the opposite viewpoint, which is to not assume. Um, where, how, how does this connect in with, you know, uh, the question that was asked? Well, I think there's, um, my theory is that there's a, a sort of an ingrained connection between 
whether or not how people view some other person's beliefs or lack of beliefs about an invisible agent and whether or not they are trustworthy. Um, and the, the reasoning would go like this. If you believe in an invisible agent, especially one like a God that can punish you or reward you, you're less likely to act immorally because secret violations of morality are not possible. If you say that you don't believe in an invisible agent, then you are the kind of person who must believe that secret violations of morality are possible. And so everything else held equal, people who believe in invisible agents are more trustworthy than people who don't. Um, that's what I think is going on. And so um, even though the apologists aren't making that argument at all, I think that just by bringing up the topic of morality, they're tapping into that hardwired bias. Um, and so it's not a level playing field when we have a debate because um, someone like me who's saying that it's rational to not believe in invisible agents, I, I not only... Oh, I think I think we got you back. Yeah, I think there was a connection issue. How much did did, did my answer get cut off? Around the last ten seconds of it did. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I just I think I think people like me have a little bit of an uphill battle because I I not only have to win the intellectual debate, but I have to earn moral credibility. Um. Uh. Because uh, I think just intuitively, people don't put as much thought into it as I just said. But I think there's just sort of an intuition that if someone doesn't believe in invisible agents, whether they're gods, angels, Santa Claus, leprechauns, whatever, and I'm not trying to trivialize things by saying they're all equal to leprechauns, but whatever, um, that they can get away with stuff. And so they're not trustworthy, even if the apologist never makes that argument. Stephen, I'll make you a deal. Okay. If you upgrade to free thinker, I'll go ahead and say it. <laughs> If you agree, you got to put that in the chat. If you agree to upgrade to Freethinker, I'll go ahead and say that. I was like, hmm, maybe I should tell him to do a super chat. No, no, membership upgrade. Membership upgrade. Then I will say it. I'm going to say it. Well, if you upgrade to Freethinker today. And guys, by the way, if you upgrade your memberships or become a member today at atheistsolidarity.org, we have a lot of cool membership benefits on our website. We mail you laptop stickers, lapel pins, sign books from famous atheists all around the country. Um, we really do want to show that your contributions mean a lot and that we care about you. We care about all of you doing the best in your activist and intellectual lives. Uh, and we, we really do want to reward our members when they upgrade or when they become members. So it means a lot. Wonderful way to me for me to put that in there. So, uh, so, so Stephen, if you do that, we got a deal. We got a deal right there. Um, Let me uh, say one other thing, if I could, Thomas, please. which is... Um, Everybody knows Pascal's wager that you should bet on God. Um, I would like to suggest an answer to the worry I just brought up about atheists being less moral people because of secret violations of morality. I was tempted to call it Louder's wager, but that, that would be kind of egotistical. So instead, I'll call it the morality wager, which is that um, whether you believe in God or not, you shouldn't bet on God existing you should bet on being a moral person. Uh, because if there is a God, um, it's much more likely that he cares about our behavior than he cares about our beliefs about him. That whole quote about the the, the Pope saying, uh, Pope Francis saying, even, even atheists can get into heaven now. Uh, all right, everybody. Yeah, that was pretty I interesting, mean, right? The greatest good people uh, out there. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, now, Christians who hear my morality wager are gonna are gonna you know uh, argue and say, ah, but you know you're not saved by works. Um, you have to believe. Yeah, that that is what Christianity says. But um, I'm not um, I'm not blindly assuming that if God exists, Christianity is true. So um, you know, out of all the different versions of supernaturalism, I think theism is the most likely. But out of all the different versions of theism. Um, I think that Abrahamic uh, religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are implausible. Um, so if, if God does exist, I would bet on 
Um, first of all, I don't think there's a simple it's eternal bliss or eternal hell. Um, and then secondly, whatever happens to you, I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's based on your beliefs so much as it is on your behavior. So if you want to if you want to play the wagering game, uh, bet on being a moral person. I think that's a good way to good way to frame it. And I, I and that wager game gets presented to me a lot at conferences. So um, I'll be sure to bring that up next time. Credit to Jeff Louder. With a fiscal incentive, every 10 cents, that argument gets brought up. Jeff gets a check. <laughs> uh, and this is where we're going to get owned. OK, Jeff, we got Stephen asking, what does an atheist think about how gifts end up under their trees on December 25th each year? Did they evolve under the tree? That's a big gotcha. That's that's the new viral TikTok clip of the Atheists for Liberty guys getting owned. I, I don't know, Stephen. I think you got us because evolution can't explain that. Oh, wow. Man. I'm speechless. I don't know what to say to that. Our careers are over. I think we have yeah. to end the stream right now. Um, that's it. <laughs> we got Justin asking another common question. Atheist, yeah, yeah. Um, how do you find meaning in life? Uh, I, I'll just make a quick commentary before you answer that from the from the AFL perspective. Unfortunately, in the culture wars now, there's been this kind of secular, almost like a secular argument against the atheistic viewpoint that well, we don't have mean we don't have meaning, and now we all need to go back to religion. We need to go back to church, or else we're going to have this God-shaped hole within us. We can't have we won't have any meaning. All of the last twenty years of secular activism is now out the door because now we're going to all of a sudden get get a high off of this God-shaped hole argument. And I think it's more important that we try to address this question. So yeah, oh, if you're an atheist, where do you get your meaning? Where do you, Jeff? get your sense of meaning and purpose in life. Yeah. So um, I try to not roll my eyes and express contempt when I hear this question, because it, it is a good question. It is. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't want to suggest that anyone who thinks this question or asks it is, is dumb. That's not what I'm saying. But uh, the reason I roll my eyes is actually quite different. I roll my eyes at this when I do roll my eyes, because this would be, like exhibit A in a courtroom trial on words that should be deleted from the English language. The expression, the meaning of life is almost worthless in conversation. You ask three people, what do they think they mean when they ask what is the meaning of life? And you're bound to get at least five opinions. Um, nobody knows what the hell that question is even asking. So if we don't know what the question is asking, how how can you expect to get, first of all, get an answer that's responsive to the questioner? And secondly, uh, how could people uh, agree on what it means? So what I always say is I need you to ask the question in a way that does not use the word meaning. Yeah. Um, and, and what you usually find out is that the person is worried about the final outcome of the universe. They'll say, well, you know, if God doesn't exist, nothing I do now really matters. And the word really is doing a lot of work here, and it's got a bunch of hidden assumptions built into it. So why do you say really with a lot of oomph when you say the word really? What, is, what does that really mean? And then they'll replace the word really with ultimately, okay? What do you mean by ultimately? And, and what you eventually get at um, if they're able to organize their thoughts is this idea that, well, you know, whether I'm a good person or a bad person won't matter 5 billion years for now. Okay. Uh, or it won't matter when the heat death of the universe happens. Um, and, and then you ask, but what do you mean by won't matter? Um, that's another word that is worthless um, in, in these, in these kind of exchanges. And it always seems to boil down to, well, it doesn't affect the outcome. The universe is still going to experience a heat death, whether I'm a good person or a bad person. Okay, so you're telling me that if I add God in the equation, that I will change the final outcome? I mean, let's think about this. So on the assumption that God exists and one of the Abrahamic religions is true, God has his plan, whether it's the Islamic plan, the Christian plan, the Jewish plan, whatever God has in mind ultimately is going to happen, right? Right. Um, if you're a Christian, you know, Satan is going to be tossed into the lake of fire 
and that's the end of him. And any angels that join him in his rebellion, they're goners. Um, uh, anybody who's getting into heaven gets into heaven, um, and they can't sin when they're in heaven. Anybody who's going to hell, they're going to hell, and there's no possibility of, ex of escape, no matter how repentant they are, no matter how much they want to love God. Nothing, nothing changes the final outcome if God exists. So if, if what we're really talking about is, when we talk about the meaning of life, is um, the ability to affect the final outcome of the universe, you don't get that with God. So why would it matter if you don't get it without God? That shouldn't be what our concern is from a meaning of life perspective. What we should really be focused on uh, instead of affecting the final outcome would be um, uh, uh, transcending uh, our, our nature by trying to orient the way that we live our lives so that um, uh, we can uh, enable ourselves and other people to, to live better. And how do you do that? Part of it is by getting educated. Part of it is by developing relationships with other people. Um, uh, you know, if you have children, being a good parent. If you don't have children, having good friendships, whatever your relationships are, doing, uh, pursuing a career that, um, you know, adds value to society, however you define that. Those are the things that I think when I hear the question, you know, what gives life meaning? Those are the things that give my life meaning. And the fact that, you know, the universe in one trillion years or whatever is going to suffer a heat death, I don't give a crap about that. Um, I, I, and I honestly, I, I, I have a hard time buying the idea that anybody gives a crap about that. People say that they do, but humans can't even comprehend the idea of a billion. Yeah. I mean, we yeah. talk about billionaires, but the human brain is not good at things on this kind of scale. So when someone says that, you know, they're all dejected and they're uh, they're anxious or they would be depressed if, you know, they, if God doesn't exist and eventually not only is humanity going to go extinct, but the sun is going to swallow the earth up and the galaxies are going to spread apart and it'll just be a cold, dark universe. I don't think anybody really cares about that. They say they do, but I don't think they can comprehend it. And I don't think you can be afraid of something that you don't comprehend, not in that way. I mean, you can be afraid of, of yeah. things that are, I didn't say that quite right, but I just, I, I don't buy that people are actually upset about that because no. I don't think that they understand it in the way that they would need to understand it to be afraid of it. I think what they do understand is the idea that they're alive now and they can't imagine being dead when they're dead. And that's the end of it. Lights out. I think I think they can understand that. But the idea of, well, you know, I'm I'm upset because the universe uh, won't have conscious life in billions of years in the future. Who cares? Uh, yeah. that, that, we're not, that we're not going to be around nothing. anyways. And our children's 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 children are not going to be around as well you know this kind of reminds me of, of some of the stuff you know I, I i scroll through tiktok late at night i scroll through youtube late at night i, I always find an interesting science related astronomy video about the eventual heat death of the universe and i've always been interested in that um it is kind of scary i will admit as a, as a person to think of the fact that everything will eventually end but i think about that for like 10 minutes and then i go and scroll on to the next video <laughs> and i think that most most people are that way when it comes to this topic you know uh, yeah, it is an interesting question to ponder about, but then we all wake up and we get on with the rest of our lives. No matter how crazy our lives are, no matter the different circumstances, I think yeah, I mean, a I, great, fantastic life or a life that needs a bit of improvement. I don't. Most humans don't don't think about that uh, that question for for that long amount of time. I agree. Um, I mean, I I wish that um, uh, I was going to live longer than I expect to be alive uh, as a naturalist. But I think there's a real question about whether or not eternal life would be boring. And I, I think that this gets dismissed by theists. Maybe it won't be boring, but just like I as an atheist will say, it's not a stupid question to ask, mm -hmm. how do you have meaning without God? I would say return the favor and at least acknowledge it's not a stupid question to ask, how would it not get boring after... A hundred trillion trillion years of living as you know 
as a ghost or, you know, uh, uh, in the new Eden on earth or whatever, maybe it won't be boring, but it's, it's not a stupid question. And I would go farther and say, I think it's right. an open question. It's a very um, open question. I remember right? Christopher Hitchens talked about how going to heaven is like worshiping an eternal, I guess at the time, Kim Jong-il, uh, you know, uh, worshiping kind of in an eternal North Korean um, kind of sense of just constantly praising the dear leader for forever, for eternity. Um, and I think a lot of religious people think in a certain way, like many of us, ma many humans in general think about like love and marriage, for instance, you know, uh, dating and relationships, for instance, we all get obsessed with the idea of, of I guess, is from the male perspective, courting a woman and then eventually going on dates and then and then putting the ring on her finger and then marriage and this kind of sense of happily ever after yeah. not understanding that okay then you have to live with that person then there's a whole new book a whole new story um with eventual problems and issues after happily ever after ever happens um but we see everything through the context of that kind of that kind of disney movie um we see heaven through the context mm -hmm. of well, we're going to die and the rapture is coming one day, but then we're all going to ascend as spirits into heaven together. Um, okay, then what happens when you get there, right? Mm -hmm. You were mm -hmm. saved from from the doom of, of the heat death of everything. Fantastic. Now, what's what's going on after that? You know? mm -hmm. um, yep. it, that in, its, in and of itself is a scary thought to think of, you know, if you believe that there is uh, an afterlife. Yep. So... Um, we'll get into, uh, one more question or comment, and then we will end the show from here. We got Jesse Cruz saying heaven is considered life with God. And if God is happiness, a wholeness and joy, uh, without human issues, such as depression and whatnot, it's eternal goodness. You get judged. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I've, I, 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 I've, I've heard answers like that before. Um, uh, I'm not questioning, I'm speaking hypothetically here because I don't think God exists, but I'm not questioning that um, if if heaven is real and people go to heaven, that it is uh, good and happy uh, when they get there. What I'm questioning is after a hundred trillion years, if it's still as good and happy as it was when you first arrived. Because um, uh, you're literally talking about an infinite uh, existence. So uh, I, I, I don't have a knockdown argument to prove that for sure every single person will get bored. But I mean, after doing anything a billion times, a trillion times, um, I think, I th like I said, I think it's an open question whether or not it would get boring, which is why I've run into a lot of people who say, you know, I would like to live longer than I'm going to live in this body here on earth but I, I don't necessarily want eternal life. And some people would say, you know, I want to live a thousand years or, or maybe a million, but whatever the number is, there's a big difference between that and infinity. Right. It's very short compared to infinity. If you think about yeah. It. Yep. So I think that's a good way to end it from there, guys. So I'll make a, a few more announcements. So again, guys, join Atheists for Liberty today. A lot of the things we're talking about, a lot of the things we're doing across this country is happening thanks to all of you injecting your ideas and being a part of the discussion. And if you join today and become a member, I'm going to be refreshing my email inbox a few minutes after we chat here. We're going to be going to the Atheist Celebrity Discord server and hanging out, uh, cracking open some drinks and cracking some jokes too. Um, and I'd love for all of you to come in and give us your thoughts as to how you all thought the stream was. So we're going to be hanging out on Discord for a little bit. Um, so join today at atheistforliberty.org, become a member, and make a tax-deductible organization to a growing, amazing nonprofit. It really means a lot, and we're doing a lot of great work and providing a lot of amazing, entertaining content. Um, we really do want to provide a, a lot of great content and showcase some of these greatest minds in this new age of reason that we're in. And it's because of that that we're going to be streaming every single week. So tune in next Tuesday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific for our next stream. Subscribe to this YouTube channel, like this video, and hit the notification bell to see more content. But not only that, we're also streaming now on, on our Twitter account, at Atheist Liberty, and our Facebook account as well. So uh, if you're watching from those platforms, be sure to like and follow um, our channels there. We want all of you to become part of the movement. We're doing a lot what we can to not only change minds, but to advance 
our goals. We want to normalize atheism, preserve free thinking, safeguard secularism, and advance individual liberty. So I really want to thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you so much for coming on the channel. You've always been a great ally and supporters to ours online. Um, and thank you all that you have done to promote naturalism and reason and atheism online before any of us could. <laughs> thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. All right, guys. See you all later.